Welcome back, everyone. I am so excited to introduce our second panel and build on the amazing uh, discussion and presentation from our first panel um, and, and eager to get this started. Like I said, our moderator, um, whom I'll turn over to in just a moment, is Chan Kemper, the Senior Legislative Attorney at LAPA. And uh, she will be moderating a panel about how these settlement funds can accelerating addressing the overdose crisis and spur innovation, which I think really gets at the heart of what so many of us are trying to do uh, with this conference. And on that panel, um, it's just an all-star lineup, Dr. Miriam Delphin Rittman, the Director of Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, also called SAMHSA, Robert Kent, General Counsel of the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy, and Brandon George the director of Indiana Addiction Issues Coalition and vice president of recovery programs and advocacy, Mental Health America of Indiana. I cannot wait to hear what this panel has to say. So without further ado, Shan, I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much. And I just wanna say I am very excited and honor, honored to moderate this panel. Uh, my name is Shan Kemper, as you've been told, and I will be your moderator today on what I think will be a very exciting and interesting discussion. A little bit about me uh, before we get started. I'm a senior legislative attorney for LAPA, and I'm also a former um, legislative analyst for the Kentucky legislature, which is why I'm particularly thrilled to moderate this panel today. Uh, the legislative process and state budgets will have a significant impact on opioid settlement funds, how those funds are allocated, and whether those funds can and, be, and will be used to, for their intended purpose. Uh, today, our panelists will be discussing a variety of wide range of topics around the opioid crisis, innovation, harm reduction, how legislators and policymakers can safeguard or guardrail settlement funds for their intended purpose the role of the federal government in this process, how state budgets may impact settlement fund allocation, and essentially who should also have a seat at the table in making decisions about opioid litigation settlement fund use. Uh, finally, some housekeeping. This panel is scheduled to be about an hour and a half. Each panelist will talk for about 10 to 15 minutes, which will leave us just enough time for a robust and I think interesting question and answer period. Please use the Q&A feature um, for any questions or comments for the panelists. I will be checking that and making sure that we get a wide range of questions. Uh, Robert, would you like to start? Sure, happy to. Um, good morning, everybody, or good mid-morning. Uh, so um, I probably bring a little unique perspective to this conversation in that um, while I'm honored at this point to be the general counsel at the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy, uh, in a previous life, I spent most of the last 14 years at the, as the general counsel at the New York State Agency that oversees addiction services and supports, um, and in fact was involved in the, the New York Attorney General's litigation, had the, the privilege, in quotes, of being deposed for most of a day by the defendants in that litigation um, and have had a strong interest um, in this uh, issue. I mean, the, the, the answer is short, but, but uh, you know, I'm an attorney, I'm going to talk for more than this, but the, the short answer is these funds can absolutely help us address what's going on, which, you know, if it's been cited, I apologize, and it'll probably be cited again. But you know the latest uh, 12 month CDC numbers, it's almost 97,000 drug overdoses in the United States. Um, so obviously we need to do more. I, I know from my experience, um, this the, the funding that's gonna come in used in the system we're talking about um, is stretched to the max. So it can go a long way. The other thing, and, and obviously I'll talk more in depth, is this is an opportunity because it doesn't come with all the parameters um, that other funds come that are you know that are put forward by government. So there's an opportunity for us to 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 see these funds used to support activities that government doesn't fund currently or funds partially for us to to identify good models for certain types of uh, work. Um, in, 
if we were to do this right, I really think that this funding would assist us in reducing not just drug overdoses and overdose deaths, but the cost of funding, you know, the, a system that helps people find their, their way to stability and recovery. So um, I, just a few things I have to add at the front end. Um, what, and, I, and I just caught the last, the, the back end of the previous panel. And there's, you know, there are a whole bunch of, of issues obviously, as it relates to protecting this money. I mean, the settlements alone won't protect the money. And I speak from my experience as a lawyer in New York um, and, and, and from understanding what's going on around the country. You know, funds that come into government usually go into a state's general treasury or general fund and need to be protected or dedicated. Um, and I'll put a plug in at this point, Chan will appreciate this. So LAPA is our partner. And I know um, they've worked um, to put together a model act about creating a dedicated fund and, and all the, the structure to support that. Um, they did that with us and, and I know it was sent around. So if you have input, send it in because we do wanna put that out there because we do wanna take a leadership position in, in helping states and local governments figure out the best way to maximize the use of these funds. So please plug, you know, read the read the model act, provide your comments so we can broadcast it to the to the nation on, on our best advice on how to, to do this the right way. Um, one of the first things I have to say, and I, I sort of caught the back end in Mark when he was speaking, and there was a comment about politicization. Well, the funds are going into government and politicians run government. So I think it's unavoidable that that's going to be involved. What I would say though, and, and you know, the Model Act speaks to this, the states that are enacting their own laws already speak to these. There's an advisory board or there's an oversight board being appointed. Um, that's the opportunity for folks in recovery, um, folks who are actively in treatment, um, family members who've been impacted by the, you know, the overdose epidemic, you know, to seek to be placed on these boards. Um, so we really do hope, I mean, one of the things we would hope is, is those kinds of individuals are advocating for themselves and are being considered to be on these boards. They will best advise, you know, the states and local governments on how to best spend the money. As I indicated, we would hope there's a prioritization for use of the funds to pay for things that government doesn't necessarily pay for right away or right now. And when I say that, a um, few examples, um, harm reduction. And, and let me be clear, when I'm speaking about harm reduction, I'm talking about syringe service programs and naloxone um, access. There are, it's a maze, but, but suffice it to say that by and large government doesn't directly fund um, SSPs in particular, and they work. And, and as I think most of you would know, when we issued the, the administration's policy priorities for ONDCP in, in uh, April, you know, expansion of, of harm reduction services is a, is a key priority for ONDCP. Um, it's something that we're gonna advocate for constantly because it works. And, and you know, as if you think in the short term, 97,000 drug overdose deaths, you know, we're in a ground war and it's mass casualties and we need to be doing everything we can. And, and one of the best interventions is syringe service programs. They, they meet people where they're at, but the fact is they're meeting people. And so they're, they are one of our best first interventions. Um, I'm sure many of you know, uh, federal funds can't be used currently to purchase the syringes. They can't, you know, federal funds can be used to support other services within an SSP. But we really think as we're trying to expand the reach of SSPs, it's important for that to be considered. Naloxone, purchasing naloxone and getting it distributed, um, purchasing fentanyl test strips and getting them distributed, we think are key interventions that will help us do what we ultimately need to do with, this, with these funds, which is to reduce um, the impact of opioids. 
another area that we really hope folks would look at is recovery supports and recovery housing. We think those are important activities um, as we help people find their way to a stable life and recovery. It doesn't end when they've had either services at an SSP or, or they've had services at a, at a treatment program. We need to support them when they go back into their communities so they can maintain that stability. Um, and then another key area which we really hope funds would be used for is to provide um, MOUD in jails and prisons. Um, we, there's no doubt, right? We have a strong interest in, in um, exploring opportunities to do criminal justice reform, but you can't ignore the fact that while the activity is occurring, um, people are incarcerated and they go in with, with substance use disorders, opioid use disorders. We need to make sure that they get the treatment. Uh, many of them went into incarceration actively in treatment in the community. Um, there are, you know, prohibitions on the use of funds, especially federal funds right now, um, as it relates to this activity, or I shouldn't say prohibitions, but there's limits on the funds being available and usable. Um, and, and again, and you can, many of you have probably seen the research, you know, we can send it if people would like to see it. The, the, one of the most at-risk populations for, for overdose death is people coming out of incarceration um, who've not received treatment. And so making sure that those kinds of activities are supported. Um, and then uh, another area we hope folks would look at is uh, criminal justice deflection programs. Again, while we work to try to reform the criminal justice system as it relates to the, you know, incarcerating or, or bringing into its uh, arresting folks who are primarily committing crimes that relate to their use of substances, you know, again, that's occurring right now. You don't change the laws in a second. It takes time. The states really control that activity. Um, so while you're doing that, there are all these great activities going on all over the country, um, you know, supported by law enforcement all over the country to, to take people out of the criminal justice system whose primary issue is a substance use disorder or an opioid use disorder. So we really again, hope that the funds get used for those kinds of purposes. Um, another thing that we, we really want to emphasize is as these decisions are being made, that they're, there's an, they're being made with an intention to address equity issues. I mean, the research is there. There is no doubt that the, the impact um, and it's probably become worse as time has gone on or more pronounced, there is no doubt that the impact on the BIPOC community as it relates to drug use, criminalization of drug use, um, disproportionate impact. So as we make these investments over these number of years with, with what will be, in all honesty, a really significant amount of funding for this uh, system, that those decisions are being made um, by people you know, who come from those communities and, and with the other advice that I offered, um, but are being made in a way that addresses the disparate impact or the disparate services that, that assist those communities in finding their way to stability and recovery. Um, I, and I missed most of the first panel, I apologize, it comes with the territory, but, these are gonna be annual conversations, just to be clear. I, I heard the conversation at the end of the previous um, panel about what if a state or a locality seeks to divert the use of the funds. Um, there'll be plenty, I, I suspect, of conversation, if not litigation on the matter. But even in a state, so for instance, in New York, they created a dedicated fund but funds and governments are appropriated by legislatures as a, you know, and proposed by governors or executives. And it's same on the local level. Those funds, you can't, so in New York, for example, they can't 
create appropriations that extend beyond one fiscal year. And I'm assuming it's similar, although I can't speak with authority in other states. So these are gonna be annual conversations about making sure the funds are, are spent for the purpose for which they were you know, derived, which is to abate the overdose epidemic. And um, I, I'll end with this, and I don't wanna be ominous in any way, but you know, there's a conversation at the federal level about the, the need or possibility of recoupment of um, some of these funds as it relates to any federal funds or any federal funding that paid for services that have now been questioned um, in the context of the litigation. Um, so I wanna be really clear, I'm not telling you the federal government's gonna seek to recoup funds, but, the, but that, that there is an obligation at, at HHS in particular to, to explore that question. And the question is being explored by attorneys at the federal level. And so I can, I, it's not been resolved. We hope that it's resolved soon. What I can definitely say is people at the federal level who have to answer those questions or advise others who have to answer the questions are going to be look, looking at how the funds are being spent. And so, um, Stay tuned on that. And I, don't, I hope that the Q&A doesn't devolve into a conversation over that issue because it's not my intention, but I'd be remiss if I didn't point that out. But I think if nothing else, I hope it instructs those that make the decisions at the state and local levels to be smart about how they're going to look to protect the funds and then invest the funds. Um, so with that, I hope I didn't go too long, but I'll stop talking. Thank you so much, Dr. Rittman. Yes, thank you so much. I, I appreciate the invitation to be here and, and Robert, appreciate your comments. I mean, so many of the areas that you recommended in terms of uh, you know, encouraging states to think about uh, recovery, absolutely, we know that's important. Uh, harm reduction, an important area to invest in potentially. Uh, you know, Thinking about uh, medication for opioid use disorder in prisons, absolutely. Um, criminal justice, uh, you know, connections and, and, and looking to ways to uh, divert individuals and, and to fund court-related programs, so critical. Um, and of course, equity, um, all of those areas are so critical. And so thank you for your comments. Um, I'm going to piggyback on that a little bit. And, and um, essentially, I have some slides that I'm going to show. And um, what I'll do is I'm going to talk about, uh, you know, some of our current funded programs and then just share some of the innovations that we're seeing. Um, one thing that uh, in my previous role as commissioner, you know, we would often say that we loved sort of bootlegging from each other and sort of learning from each other's uh, sort of uh, innovations. And, and uh, if we heard something had a strong uptake and it seems like it would fit within our community and there are ways to, to sort of address equity. Um, it, it was always so helpful to be able to just uh, take some of those innovations and then apply them in different settings. Um, so next slide, please. So that's what, essentially what I'm going to do in my time. I, I'm just going to share about different uh, currently funded programs and some of the innovations that, that we've seen uh, as, as just examples of uh, possible programs to think about in terms of funding. Um, before I start, the, the one thing I do want to encourage is, you know, I encourage states to take an inventory really take a good inventory of their uh, funded programs, uh, take a look at what's in place, take a look at what may be gaps. Uh, and, and that certainly could be one place to start uh, in terms of where additional funds or resources could be dedicated, uh, particularly if there are gaps as it relates to either services or programs or innovations um, that are not able to be supported. Uh, as Robert mentioned, off of federal funds or off of state funds. So um, lots of potential opportunity here. Um, so the first program we're gonna talk about is our state opioid response grant. Uh, real quickly, this is a grant where it funds states to be able to implement a range of innovations as it relates to prevention, treatment, recovery, uh, for intervention, uh, for individuals struggling with opioid use disorder uh, or stimulant use, use disorder as well. Uh, the, the award was recently expanded uh, to be able to fund stimulant use disorder 
um, uh, uh, diagnoses as well. Um, and so just a couple innovations that, that we've seen here, for example, Ohio, one thing Ohio has done is they've developed a, uh, they call it the Ohio Care Line. Um, it is a line that uh, people are able to call, they're able to talk with a person live, uh, and then essentially be triaged to other services and supports. Uh, and it's, uh, it happens real time. Um, so far, they've been able to connect over 6,100 people to services and supports, and this started in April 2020. Uh, so that's one innovation that we've seen. Um, in Tennessee, one thing Tennessee did is they developed a regional opioid prevention specialist. Um, these specialists do training really statewide, um, training related to opioid awareness, training related to uh, naloxone uh, distribution, uh, trainings across really upon request. And so they are doing training far and wide. They also do harm reduction training. Uh, in terms of you know, fentanyl test strips or naloxone. And so that uh, is a group that has been active uh, across the state of Tennessee. Um, they've trained more than 28,000 individuals in a range of uh, awareness, opioid awareness, as well as harm reduction strategies and supports. Uh, next slide, please. Um, our Tribal Opioid Response Grant, and so, so TOR, uh, so this is a grant that it, it is used to fund tribal communities, um, essentially to increase access to culturally responsive. So we know this is so important for tribal communities to be able to implement uh, culturally congruent strategies uh, as, a, as, part of the, um, as part of their grant making process to, to, and part of their process for helping to address opioid use disorder. Um, and so we've seen a number of innovations here. Similar to the, the previous grant I mentioned, this grant funds, again, uh, prevention, treatment, recovery, uh, program, services, interventions, harm reduction as well uh, for both opioid and stimulant use disorder. Um, so just a few innovations that we've seen here, for example, the, the Great Plains Tribal Chairman Board, um, they have developed a 19 week webinar. So a 19 week webinar that, uh, very, that addresses various topics, including uh, drug overdose, drug trafficking, um, how to access services and supports. Um, they also incorporate culturally congruent strategies and, and ways of healing as part of that webinar series as well. Uh, so wonderful work that they're doing. Um, another grantee for this, for this particular grant, the, the White Earth Band Chippewa In Indians, um, they have funded a whole uh, team of recovery support specialists, peer support specialists um, that work at the community level. Um, they work to engage people to help connect them to services and supports. Um, they also use culturally congruent strategies uh, in terms of connecting people and, and meeting with people. Um, they've been able to help connect people to medication assisted treatment. Um, and so it's wonderful, wonderful to see some of the outcomes that they've been able to develop at the community level. Um, next slide, please. So I'm just going to go quickly through, a, you know, a few other grant uh, programs and share some innovations. Um, Matt Padoa. So this grant, the goal of this is to help increase access to medication assisted treatment um, at the community level. Um, and so uh, this grant, there's a travel component to it, as well as, uh, you know, a, another component that is for, you know, anyone that applies. Um, we've seen some real significant innovations here as well. For example, Rutgers University. Um, they initiated peer navigators, a specialist program. Um, and as a result of the peer navigators, who again, worked at the community level, meeting people where they're, they were at, um, they were able to increase access to buprenorphine by 22%. Um, the navigators were deployed because they saw that there was a, there was a, they were starting to see a decrease in the uptake of buprenorphine. Um, so the navigators went and uh, they were able to help uh, create an increase there. I think some of the magic, if you will, of, of navigators is they often will share their own recovery stories. You know, they, they are individuals who are in long-term recovery um, and their stories often help to give people hope. So I think across all of these grant programs, one thing that we've seen is an innovation that, that is present really across all of our centers, that is prevention, treatment, uh, you know, and uh, even CMHS. Um, that people in recovery uh, have really played a, a real significant and value role with connecting people to services and supports. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so this is another uh, first responder program. So this is called the First Responder Comprehensive Addiction. Uh, it's, it's part of the, the CARA. 
uh, so first responder care a program. And essentially what we do here is we fund first responders, we fund grantees really to work with first responders um, around naloxone dissemination uh, and they do training as well. Um, two real innovative programs that, that I just wanna lift up and highlight the DuPage County Health Department of Illinois. Um, they share information uh, with grantees. They essentially have developed, it's almost, it's, it's like a geomapping. It's a, essentially a geomapping um, resource where people are able to see, for example, where um, naloxone has been distributed, where the drug take back boxes are, um, where the substance abuse providers are located around the state. Uh, and so this is a real valuable resource that allows people to sort of at a, at a click of a button really, uh, you know, look at this map and see where within the state various resources are located. Um, Philadelphia, I love this. Philadelphia developed, they call it their alternative response unit. So AR2. Um, and what AR2 does, it's a team that works directly with first responders. And so sometimes what we see at the community level is when people overdose, um, they may not want to be transported to the hospital. You know, they, they, they feel like they're okay and, and they're good, they don't need to go. Um, and so what Philly does is they will then deploy AR2 and AR2 includes a case manager and a paramedic um, that will go to the scene uh, and continue to work with the person and try to engage them in services and supports. Um, so it provides additional support and support with individuals that are especially trained in uh, substance use uh, disorder. Next slide, please. Um, just some, some more examples. So this, this program here, this is a, the PDO grant program. We call it the grant uh, for pre pre prescription drug overdose uh, related deaths. And the goal is really to, to intervene here. Um, and to reduce the uh, prescription drug overdose deaths that we're seeing. Oklahoma has done some real innovative, uh, you know, real innovative work in terms of uh, naloxone distribution and training. And we see quite a bit of that. Uh, so they've done quite a bit of naloxone training uh, uh, statewide. Um, South Carolina has done some really creative work around developing a reporting system. So an, uh, a web-based um, naloxone reporting system uh, for law enforcement and firefighters to be able to um, both indicate where the naloxone has been used, but then also to, to report, uh, you know, to report their activity related to use and what they're seeing. Um, and so that's been a, a valuable program as well. Next slide. I think I know I, I might be coming short on my time, but um, harm reduction, you know, we've heard a lot about harm reduction today, so I won't spend too much more time here. But again, this is such a, a valuable um, area of work in terms of helping to connect people to harm reduction supplies. But, you know, I often think of it also as planting really important seeds uh, because, you, you know, a person may not in the moment, you know, if they, if they pick up their syringe or their fentanyl test strip, it's also an opportunity to give a card, you know, a card with a number to, to help people connect people to services and supports. Um, so we see a lot of innovative work here, uh, you know, across the country. Uh, in terms of harm reduction sites where people can walk in and, and receive harm reduction supplies as well as information about treatment. Um, often the harm reduction sites are staffed by people in recovery. So again, it's another opportunity um, to employ people in recovery at these sites. Uh, and so harm reduction is, is absolutely a priority for the administration. Uh, certainly something that SAMHSA is very interested in. We work closely with CDC in this area. Um, and so I encourage, you know, I encourage folks as you're thinking about the, the, um, the funds, uh, harm reduction could, give, could be a valuable area to, uh, to invest as well. And again, all kinds of innovation. We, we see harm reduction vans uh, where people are, are funding um, vans that are staffed by to include people in recovery that will go to hotspots. Uh, and then from those hotspots are able to disseminate, again, treatment information, harm reduction supplies. Um, some of those vans actually have uh, prescribers on board as well. So some of them are like a one-stop shop um, clinic, but in a van, or in some cases we've seen RVs as well. Um, there's one in, in Connecticut called Mobile One, uh, and it's a full RV that has harm reduction supplies, um, as well as a clinic on site uh, to be able to do sort of low dose or low barrier induction. Um, next slide, please. Um, another, you know, I've talked about some of the tribal innovations. Again, like Native Connections is another uh, grant uh, that is for tribal communities. Uh, it, it's, it's wonderful to see the ways in which both 
um, culturally congruent sort of strategies and approaches to healing are implemented alongside traditional strategies. And we see this quite a bit with our tribal grants. Um, one, one thing that, uh, that we see with, with this grantee or with this, within this grant program is a grantee that has implemented, they call them kitchen, cable, kitchen table talks. Um, and it's talks between young people and elders or you know, just groups that they bring together to be able to talk about, um, about substances, but also to have uh, cultural related conversations and, and do for pa face painting or other art uh, activities while also raising awareness about substances and uh, connecting with services and support. So that's it's another example. Um, next slide, please. You know, I'm probably coming short on my time. So uh, the strategic prevention framework, this is a, a significant area of our work. Um, we know that prevention is so critical at the community level. And at the community level, uh, many of our preventionists and prevention teams uh, do really innovative work with raising awareness, both within schools, within community centers, within you know, community forums um, about um, the dangers of, of uh, substances to include opioids or about medication-assisted treatment. Um, and they do work related to disseminating uh, naloxone. Um, and so certainly uh, thinking about the prevention, you know, the prevention teams that uh, may exist within any given state uh, could be a real valuable investment. Um, often they do work, again, they'll, they'll often, it's like if they, you call them and they'll be there. And so I think that's uh, some real valuable, uh, valuable resource. Um, just a couple of examples in West Virginia, they've started a statewide education campaign uh, around stigma, uh, stigma related to uh, medication assisted treatment or substance use. And we know that is so critical um, because stigma we often hear is one significant barrier to care. Um, years ago, in fact, I remember participating in a forum and a mom said it's, it's stigma, you know, that is contributing to a lot of the deaths that we're seeing. So, you know, investing in stigma campaigns, I think, could be of real value. Um, and, and working at the community level with strategic prevention uh, framework grantees could be of value. Um, next slide, please. Um, so, you know, just other considerations, and this is one of my final slides, other considerations, again, you know, look at your data um, and look for any gaps, any gaps in terms of funding or, or, or if there are programs that are doing particularly well, might make sense to scale those up. And, and so data can be a real valuable uh, resource in terms of thinking about uh, ways to use the funds. Um, you know, a goal, of course, is to increase access to, uh, to a range of services and supports. And so really think about the healthcare continuum um, and creating multiple entryways into services, uh, both within a primary care setting as well as behavioral health. Um, housing, we know, is a, there are real critical needs there for individuals struggling with substance use uh, disorder. And sometimes housing is an area where other, other funds cannot be used. So this, this is a, uh, you know, the housing investments may be of value here. And we've talked about the importance of some of the criminal justice related investments as well. Um, next slide, please. Um, and so finally, I mean, certainly, we, you know, we know it's important and, and this is often a, a part of the conversation we hear now, so important to ensure that the funds are used um, for, uh, for opioid use disorder. Um, because that is that is certainly is where the need is now, and as Robert talked about uh, in the past, there or, or previously, uh, you know, while we don't know for sure, there is a possibility of re recoupment around funds that are mis misappropriated. But of course, we we don't know that, but um, that possibility is always there. Um, next slide, please. Um, yeah, and so you know, I I look forward to our to our conversation and look forward to taking questions. I appreciate. Uh, just the invitation to be here, and I'll stop there, and uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rittman. Brandon, you to go last, but not least. Thanks, Chan, and, and it's, it's hard to follow Dr. Rittman, but uh, I'm going to try to give us a little experience from, from Indiana over here. I do want to start out by thanking the O'Neill Institute and Georgetown Law for inviting me to be here with my, my co-panelists to talk about a very important topic. Um, you know, I guess that I view this, the opioid litigation, from two different lenses. One, I think about it uh, from a policy perspective as somebody that works with state government, um, a, a lobbyist in the Indiana legislature, um, the governor's office, attorney general, etc. I want to see how this is going to affect our systems or how it can impact our systems. And then secondly, as a person that oversees a network of recovery organizations and how this could impact 
the ability to give direct services really on um, that ground level. And so um, as an advocate, I had two primary concerns or focuses on this um, when it came to the litigation funds, one of those being how much money. And so that was one thing I was paying attention to. And the other one that I care a bunch about is who's going to administer the money? Who, who's going to have a say so in those pieces? And so, uh, and above all, I guess a third is making sure it doesn't come uh, become big tobacco 2.0. How do we make sure that the money gets spent in the appropriate places and doesn't get put into the, the general funds that Rob was talking about and, and, and put into the, the state budget, so to speak. And so I want to give an example. I think Indiana becomes a good example of how you can get it right, but it can also go very, very wrong. And what I mean by that is if you would have asked me back in April uh, how things were going in Indiana with the opioid litigation, I would have said, great. Um, the Indiana General Assembly had just passed uh, a piece that created a fund that we could put our, 500, our expected $500 million into, uh, so to speak, from the opioid settlement. There was also some language in there that was an automatic opt-in for all the counties to, to join into the state suit. And then third, um, after a little bit of tug of war between public safety and public health officials, it was decided that uh, the Family and Social Services Administration uh, and the state, as the SSA would control and administer all the funds that came in. Um, I do think it's important to note, though, that there was some tug of war on who was going to administer these funds between public health and public safety. Uh, one of those without the, the, the experience or knowledge base uh, around SUD. And so everything's going pretty well there at that point, feeling good. And then after that passed, in really short order, we started seeing local governments opt out of the state agreement. As most of you know, if you don't have the lion's share of local governments, the amount of money you get drops significantly. So all of a sudden we're in a situation where we're expecting 500 million and it looks like now we're gonna get $250 million. And so we can look back now and see that there was two pretty critical mistakes made or, or two, two pieces that really impacted that. One, our previous attorney general was really slow to file the state suit. And so that left a lot of local governments wondering if they were going to be taken care of. Uh, they took initiative on their own to start, start filing suits. And then it also created, though, a vacuum. And so that nobody was directing uh, traffic. And you start having law firms come in and, and start advocating that the government should go alone and the benefits of doing it on their own versus joining a, a state suit. And then the other piece that happened just this year with our new attorney general is as we started working out the parameters um, for what it was going to look like in Indiana, none of the local governments uh, were included in that process. And so as you could expect, um, that resulted in a lot of unhappy folks at the county and municipal level that they were not included in the process of how this was going to go out. They, they split it up that 10% was going to go to the attorney general, 15% to all the localities, and then 75% would be administered through grants and programs with the SSA. The other piece of that is that, remember how happy I was that we were going to have our SSA that was going to be administering all that money? Um, that's really was a good thing because there's checks and balances. Uh, experts have the ability to weigh in. Um, there's people in, in recovery who are involved in the boards and have a say in how that money would have been spent. Also, um, shout out O'Neill Institute for having people in recovery involved as part of this process. One thing I didn't mention is I'm a person in long-term recovery too, besides the other things that I've mentioned. And that's a, a, just a critical part to make sure we have a lived experience at the table. Anyways, they would have listening sessions, et cetera. But that's not necessarily going to be the case anymore. Now that we've got 70 localities that have opted out, uh, we are in a much, much, much different spot. And I would actually say at this point, we're really in an unenviable situation with these uh, 70 local governments, uh, so city mayors, county councils, et cetera, trying to come up with ways to spend the opioid settlement money um, that don't necessarily have uh, an enormous amount of expertise in this area or experience when it comes to SUD of what works and what doesn't work. And so 
even when the state was going to control our funds or, 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 or the bigger number, they started getting requests that um, would make your head scratch. One, one community requested that they could use the money to uh, build a new morgue. Um, and, and you started seeing infrastructure projects come up like that. There was also two counties specifically that wanted to use the money to create mental health institutions inside of their county jails. And so this is a good example of the nuance that was talking about. There is really good ways to spend some of this money in jails. Rob talked about needing to have access to medications inside a correctional setting. That is a really, really big deal. That would be a great way to spend some of this money where federal funds cannot be. But we don't need to try to create another healthcare entity inside of a county jail that doesn't work. It's cut off from third payer sources. There's no way to reimburse for services because people can't access Medicaid. Um, and an example of that would be an example of using these funds in a way that does not line up with our other funding streams and federal funds that, that are coming down. And I wanna stay focused on that piece for just a second and talk about the idea that these opioid settlement funds aren't occurring in a vacuum. There are a lot of other things going on right now. We've got big amounts of substance abuse block grant dollars coming in. Uh, Dr. Redman just talked about the, the state opioid response uh, money that, that it's coming into states that has been for a couple of years now. There's new stimulus money that's coming in, multiple packages. And so the chances of projects being duplicated are very high if you don't have the, the right plan in place or collaboration. The chance of settlement money being spent on projects that can be funded with other way uh, funding streams or are being funded already is also very high if we don't put some balance, checks and balances in place or have proper uh, collaboration. And then the fear always, I think, is not creating programs that are going to have cliffs or funding cliffs or that are going to die on the vine um, in the years to come because either they weren't thought out properly or they weren't built in a way that our system can sustain them. One of the things or examples I think that would be a good way to use the money, and it was touched on a little bit uh, with the recovery support pieces, recovery residences and recovery community organizations both, you know, there's a lot of federal funding out there and um, insurance and third payer sources that can pay for programming at these places. Um, and there's even some that can that, that can pay for some room and board, but none of it pays for bricks and sticks. None of it pays for capital. And so that would be a really unique way to fill a gap where we can get some one-time costs uh, uh, taken care of through some unique funding. And then it allows us to use the other funding for, um, for, for services and programs that are already covered. And I think this is important, but, you know, several years ago when the state opioid response money started coming in, I remember having conversations saying, you know, we, we can't wake up in five years and wonder what happened to all this money. Like, how do we use this money in ways that are going to complement the other funding? Um, and it was, you know, tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars at that point. So that when we get through this, that we've advanced. And here we are a couple of years later, and we're not talking about tens of millions or hundreds of millions. We're talking about billions of dollars. And how do we ensure that we're not just spinning in the same spot in five years or 10 years. Some people have done some really good work around the country um, in aligning previous funding streams. So how do we make sure, how do we bottle that up? How do we make sure that people are aware of it, both states and some of these local governments? Um, I think that this is especially true when it comes to community-based services. Uh, I mentioned earlier, really looking at this from two different lenses. And, and that second view is somebody that oversees uh, the Indiana Recovery Network, which is a network of recovery organizations. Uh, we provide resources to over 20 recovery organizations. For those of you that don't know what a recovery community organization uh, is, it's an independent nonprofit um, that is ran by people in recovery. Um, does not have shareholders, does not have a, a public safety North Star. The mission is really truly to be accountable to the recovery community. And there are some pretty big gaps in what is funded through them. And I think that's important. Uh, and I'm going to say, Rob mentioned it, Dr. Ripman mentioned it. 
the ability to fund harm reduction services is a really big deal. Recovery organizations and harm reduction services specifically, we started two BIPOC uh, focused recovery organizations. We have to make sure that we're getting funds to the communities that are hardest hit. And our BIPOC, BIPOC uh, brothers and sisters are being, uh, they're overdosing at a much higher rate than the rest of the population right now. The biggest increase demographically. And we gotta make sure that we cover some of the, 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 those places that are not being funded. And so um, harm reduction services, peer support, both for infrastructure, um, capital expense for infrastructure and direct services. Okay, um, last thing that I really wanna to touch on, perhaps most importantly, we have to ensure that the money coming in helps offset some of the very specific damages that have been done as a result of the overdose epidemic. Anybody working in the community knows that um, our neighborhoods are full of grandmothers and grandfathers who are raising um, their grandkids um, because mom and dad have passed away from an overdose. Um, we've got aunts and uncles uh, raising their nieces and nephews because a brother or sister is incarcerated or they passed away from an overdose. And uh, bluntly, the, the, these children are experienced adverse childhood experiences. Um, in the clinical world, we call those ACEs. And what those do is they, they're a predictor of future SUD and mental health issues. And so um, we know that we have a population that's very, very at risk. Um, and we really must implement and invest resources, uh, social, emotional learning, and similar strategies to help our youth uh, that have been affected by the epidemic. Um, and one thing I can assure you of is if we don't invest the resources now, it's going to cost a bunch more resources later on down the road um, because we know what the result's going to be. Mental health, SUD, behavioral issues. So prevention, prevention, prevention. We must keep the people alive who are struggling, but we have to take immediate and decisive action uh, when it comes to offsetting some of the damage done. So I'm anxious for a good conversation. And uh, Chan, I will turn it back to you. Thank you so much, Brandon. And thank you to all our panelists. Um, I know we will have a lot of great questions and discussion to get to. Before we start though, I wanna do a little bit of a level setting, our state budget 101. Um, because I do think the state budget process and how state budgets work will impact settlement fund allocation. And this may help inform some of the questions going forward. So I think Robert mentioned uh, for most states, the fiscal year runs from July 1st to June 30th. I think New York, it's April 1st. And discussion or rather public discussion around the budget typically starts when the government governor issues his or her budget proposal. And state law varies on how much legislatures can change the budget or um, whether or not it can take effect until the legislature approves it. The most significant portion of the budget, as mentioned by Robert, is the general fund um, or the operating budget. This is where most states uh, uh, put their general tax revenue like sales, it goes in and it pays for state spending on education, healthcare services. So during the course of the fiscal year, if revenue comes in below what the state needs to fund services, the state has a mid-year shortfall or a mid-year deficit for that year. Now we know opioid litigation settlement funds are to be allocated in theory in state budgets to help address the opioid crisis and provide meaningful, meaningful relief to communities that have been ravaged by the opioid epidemic. Um, some policymaker and advocates like Brandon mentioned are of concerns that given the history of state use of um, you know, what we're seeing kind of right now with the opioid litigation settlement funds, but also the tobacco settlement funds and what happened there, that states may be tempted to fill holes in their state budget with money that has been allocated from opioid litigation settlement. Um, and I think uh, one of our speakers put it best, Professor Glover, when she said very succinctly and eloquently, how can we oper operationalize public health priorities into settlement reality? What, again, this is a question for all our, our panelists, what can policymakers, advocates, and legislators do to ensure that the funds are used for their intended purpose within the state budget? And that's open to anyone who wants to answer on our panel. 
maybe I'll start in. So, you know, create a dedicated fund. Use the LAPA ONDCP model legislation that's coming soon. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> but but you, you have to protect the funds. Like I said, you know, in New York, just to be clear, if they had not created a dedicated fund for the settlement proceeds, the money would have gone into the general fund. And then beyond that, and we didn't really hit on this, but it's worth mentioning, you know, you also, and, and I know the Shatterproof and Hopkins folks and their principals have put this out there, use the money to enhance, to supplement what's going on, not to supplant, because you could just as easily take the funds in and say, well, that's good. We're going to use it to pay for what we're already doing. So we did use it for its intended purpose. But uh, I, I, you know, all due respect, anybody who thinks we're doing enough isn't looking at the data that's coming in. So, um, put, and, and, and I think we all hit on this, on these boards that are being set up you know, to, to, to provide input to the government because ultimately the money has to be appropriated. Even if it's dedicated to a fund, it still needs to be appropriated in the budget documents that, that governments pass annually. And so these boards, you need to have people on the boards who understand what's going on. And, and, and I speak from my own experience, it's possible for politicians to put people with lived experience on boards to give them advice. It happens all the time. And in fact, in recent years, it's happened far more often than not. But so I'd said it when I spoke, I'll say it again. People who are actively in treatment, who, you know, if you're going to make decisions about how to help people, maybe you ask the people what is helpful. People who are in recovery, um, you know, which Brandon hit on, and he's, he's one of the tremendous advocates in this country for, for stepping up. And, and the families, I, I, and I, I know from my work, I, I know far too many families who've suffered just incredible loss as a result of, of the opioid overdose epidemic. And, and many have become advocates and they can speak to like what they hear and what they see going on in their communities. So, and making sure that the representation is that of, of the full breadth of what we are as a country, that there are people from all different communities represented on these boards. Because um, the one thing you will get from them, which I always loved and I love now, they will tell you what they're thinking, which is exactly what government folks need to hear. They don't put the filters on that, that some of us have to in our, <laughs> in our position. So I'll, I'll shut up before I get in trouble. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, I, I think all of that is right on. I mean, I think the, the advocacy piece is just so, so important here. I think that is one way that, um, you know, one strategy certainly for ensuring that the funds are appropriately used. Um, and so connecting with, you know, state legislatures or, or state legislators um, around uh, ways in which the, the funds could be used. Uh, there could even be particular legislation or specific legislation uh, developed along these lines uh, that would uh, lay out ways in which the funds could be used, uh, you know, in addition to, you know, putting the resources in a dedicated account as well, that, that often helps. Um, so just those two strategies alone, you know, uh, connecting with legislators um, and sort of having the resources in a dedicated account, um, I, I think it could make a significant difference. And I won't repeat, I agree with everything said, I'm not gonna repeat that. The one thing I would mention is that the language that's used when this is being done, when you work with your state legislators, um, et cetera. So um, a lot of times, for instance, recovery has been lumped in with treatment, right? So somebody could be writing something and say, okay, this, this amount has to be spent on treatment, but it doesn't specify recovery support services. And that's just one example of making sure that the, the language that the, the, the attorneys or the LSAs or, 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 or the folks that are writing are in line with what the behavioral health world uses. And so that it's really clear. Thank you. This question is, uh, I think, for both our federal reps, but particularly for Robert, um, we are they're being asked 
In terms of the federal clawback is it issue, can you go into more detail about it? It's certainly something we've heard concerns from amongst the states. Will there be more forthcoming guidance? And uh, what are the next steps on that? So there, there will be guidance. I mean, um, attorneys across the federal government um, are discussing the issue. Um, there will be guidance coming sooner than later. But I guess I can't speak with any more depth because it's still in the deliberative process. Um, suffice it to say, I think one of the things that, that all of us, you know, in the legal realms at the federal level will be looking at is what are the states and local governments looking to do with the funds? And that will, that will impact ultimately what happens. But we understand it's an issue. It was an issue in the tobacco settlements. Um, it, 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 we, I am very optimistic within a very short order, there will be guidance issued. I, I can tell you that certain state attorneys general have asked for guidance as it relates to, as they enter into settlements and then look to see how the funds are distributed. Um, so it, it will be addressed soon. I can't speak much, I can't speak to what the guidance will say other than it will answer the questions. Dr. Rittman? Yeah, I, you know, I have no additional information to, to add there. I think, you know, because it's under development in, in many ways, we'll all be, uh, you know, we're, we're all sort of waiting to see what that's going to look like. So, thank you. So, I have a sort of, I'm going to read it because it's a sort of a paragraph slash question, but I think it's, it's, it's a good perspective. Something looming in all of this work is the practical reality of barriers, challenges that exist to make needed progress to better address opioid use disorder. For example, the state opioid response grants have been a huge challenge, money that just isn't getting spent, not, in, not getting down in local communities. How are we going to build state and local capacity so that these dollars are used effectively and targeted to efforts that have evidence that can be better scaled? And so if anyone wants to discuss, you know, how we might do that in the realm of treatment, harm reduction, prevention and recovery efforts, that would be great. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to start with that one. So certainly, you know, if a state is having trouble spending the grant, uh, the resources, certainly they should connect with their project officer related to that, um, because it'd be helpful to have a conversation to see what are, you know, what, um, what is the barrier there? Um, is it an issue of contracting? Are they running short on ideas in terms of what else they can do? Um, there is, you know, we routinely will connect states with, with other, um, other states that have um, innovations that perhaps they may be interested in that they can learn more about. Um, there are also, uh, you know, state to state meetings through NASADAD, so the National Association of State Drug and Alcohol Directors, where all commissioners meet. Um, that's also a wonderful place for uh, sharing of, of innovations and learning about ways to, to spend down those funds as well as meaningfully spend them down, not just spend them down, but meaningfully spend them down in a way that's gonna make an impact and that addresses the gaps, uh, you know, whether it be in terms of equity and, and addressing some of the disparities um, or taking a data approach to be able to identify gaps. But, but certainly I would encourage states uh, to, to use the resources that are there, whether it be project officers, um, the, the National Association, again, of uh, state drug and alcohol directors that routinely bring states together for that state to date state learning. You know, SAMHSA, we can do that as well uh, in terms of addressing whatever the particular issue is. Um, as a state commissioner, you know, recently, uh, you know, one, one thing that we hear come up a lot is the, the contracting process. And sometimes it, that takes a while. Um, and so, you know, we, we work to be flexible if, if states need uh, extensions. So they come to the end of the period, the grant period, um, and they still have programs or areas that they are, are interested in, in innovative or, or uh, implementing and innovative work they still want to do. Um, we, we often are flexible there because uh, for, for us, the important thing is that the resources reach the community um, and that they reach uh, segments of the community uh, that are in particular need. Um, and then we do have one last thing there. Um, we do have an initiative called Elevate CBOs. So that is an initiative that is geared towards community-based organizations that, that maybe haven't applied for grants or haven't um, typically held a SAMHSA grant. And so 
uh, doing a series of, of webinars around um, applying for grants, keeping grants, developing a budget, um, all of that. I think that's another way that can, uh, strategy um, that can help with using uh, you know, some of the state opioid response grants. Because ultimately maybe the community organizations will apply to the states um, for a grant. And so um, sometimes states, you know, individuals that could be applying are not necessarily applying. So an initiative like this, the goal is to increase the likelihood that uh, community members that are implementing uh, real innovative programs at the community level uh, that they will uh, ultimately apply for grants. Thank you. I will piggyback off that in the sense of, I think it's a great comparison too, is that um, Dr. Ribbon just laid out all the strategies for, you know, specifically how a state could find good innovative ways to, to spend down the SOR money. But I think that's an example of with the state, with the opioid settlement money coming in, like there's actually a process for it with the SOR money. There is support. There's people in place to help out. You've got a federal agency that has very, she, she just told us five or six solutions uh, to deal with that. How does that transfer to the opioid litigation money? Because how, what, what type of levers are folks going to have to pull um, to combat those issues with this funding? Because these are trained professionals that may be having some issues that we're talking about, that, that have some expertise. And now you're going to put that decision making in a lot of local governments who that don't have the 101 already. Um, the folks with, with, with the SOR are already professionals that know how to do this. So I think it's a, a really important, and I think that hopefully some of the conversations today will create some of these solutions. Yeah, and yeah, I mean, Brandon, I think that's such a such an important point. That, you know, there may not be the same infrastructure around these resources. Um, I can say, you know, SAMHSA, we we stand ready and, and available to assist where we can in terms of you know whether state needs ideas around uh, what other programs or initiatives to implement. We do have uh, on our uh, on our website. Uh, a, a resource or a portal, if you will, that has a number of different evidence-based practices that uh, people can implement. Uh, and many of those are focused on addressing uh, opioid use disorder. Brandon, this question's for you. So we've had several panelists mention that the settlement doesn't come in the vacuum and there needs to be coordinating amongst different groups, agencies, and organizations so we don't dupl duplicate or miss important projects uh, within the realm of opioid, addressing the opioid crisis. What entity is responsible for the oversight and coordination? Is it the SSA, State Health Department, or is that part of the problem that it's not clear? So that is gonna be part of the problem, I think, across the country. Um, it's whoever they designate to do so. Um, like I said, I felt really lucky when they created the fund. That, uh, Rob was talking about so important, this dedicated fund. It also created a pathway for our SSA to be the, 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 the entity that oversees that. But again, to reiterate, other people wanted control of that. Other people lobbied to, to, to I shouldn't use the word lobbied, advocated to, to have some control over that. And I think it's really important that whoever is also has either a very good understanding or is the same agency that controls the other funding that we've been talking about, the SOR dollars, the block grant dollars, or that it's done in a manner to where people know what's going on. Um, we're really fortunate here in Indiana. Uh, our governor, Governor Holcomb, created a, what we call the drug czar position, um, not you know the, the state version of it, but that way they can monitor what's happening in the SUD world from all the agencies, from the, the State Department of Health, from the Attorney General's office, from the SSA, et cetera, to help avoid, uh, you know, misspending, duplicating efforts, et cetera. I think to piggyback off of that, it's also going to be interesting to see how that plays into the jurisdictional power of the courts long-term post-settlement. So it's going to be a really, I think one of the things that all of the panelists have mentioned today is that who has a seat at the table it's going to be really important in terms of monitoring that and having a conversation going forward with how that is dealt with. Um, our next question, and I'm going to pull it back up right here, is, and I think uh, Dr. Rittman answered, but Robert, what role do you see the federal government playing in assisting state ledgers, legislatures in coordinating funding or reviewing funding or, and how it's spent going forward? I don't know that it relates to the funding directly. But 
you know, Dr. Delphin Rittman just pointed out a litany of supports that, that right. Santa has put forward to communities um, that are there. I, I will tell you from an ONDCP perspective, we have a strong interest um, in, in, in this issue. We've held our own convening. Um, we're going to continue to have conversations. We've engaged with states attorneys general and, and, and other national associations representing all different levels of government to continue to, to be there to provide support and guidance. Um, so I, it isn't us telling states how to spend the money. It's us giving them our best advice on, on the mechanics of setting up a structure to protect the money. I mean, obviously, you know, from, from our perspective, we issued policy priorities in April. We, we hope that the funds are used to, it to, you know, consistent with those policy priorities. We'll issue a national drug control strategy early in 2022. Um, you know, I highlighted some of the areas we hope that, that you know, the governments that receive these funds, um, you know, invest in. Because uh, we think ultimately, and I think, you know, again, I'll say it, um, we just can't lose sight of the fact that it's predicted that almost 97,000 human beings living in this country will lose their life or have lost their life to drug overdose. And, and it in the numbers, you know, aren't going better. So this is an enormous opportunity at, at a perfect time for us to make an impact on that. So I, I think everybody involved can't lose sight of the fact that, you know, that's going on. And, that, and, and you know, the, the opioid overdose epidemic, yeah, it, it, we're, we're way down the road to where it started to where it's at. But um, we can't lose sight of the fact that this money ultimately ought to be spent and dedicated to reducing drug overdoses and the harms they create in the communities um, where they occur. True, thank you. Uh, one of uh, my personal questions is dealing with sort of our, our topic of our panel, which is innovative ways to address the opioid crisis. In my research, I, LAPA is going to be uh, very soon releasing a emergency opioid antagonist uh, distribution act. So a model legislation to help increase the number of, of states that have naloxone programs and how we can improve the success of getting naloxone into the hands of individuals. Uh, but one of the roadblocks that I came upon in researching and writing this model legislation was the fact that there is not a lot of research about reducing stigma. Um, and specifically stigma for harm reduction, stigma related to getting people to carry naloxone, getting people to possess naloxone. Uh, how do we use, or how, does, how do states use uh, opioid settlement funds or just allocate fund, the funds they have allocated to help uh, reduce the stigma around harm reduction and using naloxone in, in such a crucial time? Yeah. You know, I, I just have to say that that's a, that's a great question. I, I, I appreciate that question because I think it's one that in many ways gets at one of the, a big challenge anyway, a big challenge that we see as it relates to, uh, you know, naloxone medication assisted treatment and potentially even harm reduction. Um, and so I think that the biggest thing is just to, to get information out there um, to the extent that people have real information, it reduces the likelihood of, or it reduces the likelihood of, um, you know, they're, they're the uptake of the misinformation, you know, to, to the extent that there's more um, accurate and real information. And so, you know, one thing I've seen is, is you know, doing the opioid forums, opioid or, uh, you know, substance use, or even wellness and recovery forums um, statewide. Uh, have panels with people in recovery, um, with community providers, with family members, um, where people really just share. They share their experiences um, with, with all of the above, with treatment, with um, opioid, with um, medication assisted treatment, with naloxone. I mean, all of that, I think, can help to um, reduce the misinformation that's out there and help to get, uh, get at and reduce stigma. Um, you know, sometimes even just the brief PSAs of people sharing their you know, their recovery journeys. Uh, it can help to give people hope, um, but also again, help to curb some of that misinformation. So, 
you know, that piece I think is, is important. Um, also at the community level, the work that the preventionists do, that the prevention specialists do, um, and often, you know, that includes, you know, prevention specialists working with people in recovery or working with, uh, in, in some instances, depending upon the program, um, you know, docs as well. Uh, you know, there are street psychiatry programs, for example, that are, uh, that are popping up around the country where psychiatrists are collaborating with outreach workers and people in recovery and going um, to places that are identified based on the data, identified hotspots. Um, and so things like that can also help to reduce stigma because people are getting information real time on the street when they're struggling um, and, and that can make a difference. Um, but basically, you know, I think public awareness campaigns, however they're put together, um, but put together in a thoughtful way can make a difference. Um, as well as sort of working, finding ways to reach people and, and get real information to, to combat some of the stereotypes and stigma out there, I think can make a difference as well. Thank you so much. Brandon, what do you see as an advocate? A couple of things jump out at me and specifically one of the things, Tim, that you had mentioned is about the harm reduction piece, right? And so, um, you know, there's been a lot of effort over, uh, you know, the last 20 years since uh, Faces and Voices initial summit in St. Paul, shout out, um, where a, 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 a big movement started. And that has been, a, you know, a lot of that has been reducing stigma around folks in recovery. And the harm reduction piece is, a, is kind of a separate piece of that, right? So like run around and like, I'm, you know, like how do we reduce stigma for folks that don't look like Brandon, right? That aren't a middle-aged white guy that can say, hey, I've been in recovery for 14 years. Like that is like, we, we have to get away from it. Like that can't be it. And so um, we have to, we have to normalize the, the bad pe people that use drugs aren't bad people. Um, I like what, what Dr. Edmund just said about in the community, but also with the local leaders. And so I think that a lot of people in communities, the, the stigma is reducing in the sense that they know they've got a family member that has an alcohol problem or a SUD problem, you know, their cousin does, somebody in their family has been touched by it. But what about, like, we run into a lot in Indiana with first responders. Uh, there is some real compassion fatigue for overdoses and drug users, et cetera. And so I would like to see a campaign that is local mayors, that is legislators, that is county officials supporting people in recovery openly and, and, and folks that in general from the drug using community. So a lot of work to be done there, especially, I mean, in Indiana, we had the probably the most successful syringe service program in the entire country. Uh, the reduction rate for HIV transmission in Scott County, like down to nothing. And because of politics and stigma, it just got shut down. Like it just got voted to get closed down a couple months ago. And that is literally a direct result of stigma and harm reduction specifically. So, um, and that's in a county where it was wildly successful. So mm -hmm. uh, a lot of work to be done. Yeah. yeah. You know, if, yeah, if I can chime in real quick, Brandon, I love your part about or point around um, you know, involving legislators and mayors and, and people within leadership uh, within different municipalities or states. Um, and, and I've seen that that makes such a difference. So, you know, when, when states take up or, or cities decide to do the, the forums, um, you know, the overdose forums, again, the panels can be diverse. It can, it can and really ought to include the mayor, the local legislators, people in recovery, ED docs, uh, you know, the commissioner or commissioner's designee. Um, and so in my previous role, we, we did these sometimes two, two a week, often for long, long stretches, months on end, two a week in the evening. Um, they have to be done at a time when people are, are it's easy to access them. And, and then the advertising for those has to be far and wide. Um, but it's just a great way, sort of, sort of town by town, um, to be able to involve people, but also to be able to get information out. Uh, and that does help to, I think it does help to address uh, stigma and get people's an questions answered about medication assisted treatment. A lot of times it's the, the stereotyping and stigma is due to not having accurate information about what naloxone is or what it isn't, about what buprenorphine is or what it isn't, um, about how to access services. Um, and then people sharing their stories of recovery or their experiences of recovery are so inspirational that I think it often helps to change people's views around um, you know, it, the, the, you know, we hear changing the face of addiction. It, it changes people's views and, and perceptions around um, what it means, what it means for a person to be in recovery or um, struggling with addiction. Um, so That's I a think great those point. Really go a long way. Humanizing, 
Yes, the humanizing. Safety. Absolutely. Absolutely. Robert, did you want to add anything to that? No, I just, you know, I mean, I've always um, pushed that there's this sort of untapped on some level power in the recovery community. Their stories are immensely powerful and they impact policymakers. So when you're doing advocacy, telling your story, um, and then of course, holding them accountable and, and continuing to engage them, I think, it, you know, and, and the families, I mean, the families have added a dimension in, in this overdose epidemic that, that didn't necessarily exist. And so people telling their stories, I think is immensely powerful. It, it's had an impact. I, you know, I, my experience in, in legislating in New York is the people in recovery and their family members were the real drivers to us making significant policy changes. And I think that's the, that is the, the path forward. I, I, you know, telling your stories humanizes, um, as Dr. Delphine Rittman said, you, know, it, you make it personal when you're telling your story and they understand what it means to, to make these services available and what recovery means. So. Thank you so much. We're actually going to stop about 10 minutes early so that we have an opportunity for a break before our keynote speaker. Um, I want to thank everyone again on the panel. Um, I found the, it to be enlightening and interesting, and I feel very lucky to have been able to be a part of the conversation. I'm going to kick it back over to Maria so she can uh, sort of uh, discuss where we are going to go forward. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Chan, and thank you so much for that panel. Um, I was just taking copious notes, and I think there are so many ideas that combine from panel one and panel two that we can try to integrate and build on as we go. Um, as Chan said, we're going to take a break before our keynote. We'll reconvene at 12.30, where I will introduce uh, the inimitable Shelly Wiseman, who will introduce the inimitable Regina LaBelle, um, who will give our keynote uh, address. So please uh, take 10 minutes, take a break, and we'll see everyone back at 12.30. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care.